Hey, this is Tucker, and I'm going to do a close reading of an excerpt from The Omnivore's Dilemma. And the purpose of this recorded close reading is so you can kind of hear me thinking out loud about the text as I read. Too frequently, as you're reading text, it's easy to skim or to go quickly and not pause and engage with the text in a deep way. So we're going to be, I'm literally going to play the audio, I'll pause it every time in the text where I made an annotative note, where I highlighted something or I actually made a text note for myself. So you can see me pausing at particular words, making sense of words that are challenging, making predictions, asking questions about the text, trying to make connections between the text and other points of reference that I have. And after you've seen me do this, I want you to try to employ the same strategies as you continue reading this text. From Chapter 2, The Farm. The Far End of the Food Chain. Back in 1919, when the Nailers bought this land... Okay, immediately in the beginning of this excerpt, there's a reference to the Nailers. And so I left a text note just asking, who are the Nailers? We literally have no context. So immediately, my mind is questioning, who are these people? This land. Farming was very different, and so was the Naylor farm. All sorts of crops grew here. Corn, but also fruits and other vegetables, as well as oats, hay, and alfalfa to feed the pigs, cattle, chickens, and horses. Horses were the tractors at that time. I also just highlighted this because I thought that was an interesting commentary. So we know that he's referencing 1919. And in my mind, I was just wondering, I wonder when that exact transition happened, where we moved from horses to tractors. Obviously, that move would save a lot of energy that goes into feeding and caring for horses and would probably make the act of taking care of the farm easier. So I just wondered, when did that actually happen? Back then... One out of every four Americans lived on a farm. The average farmer grew enough food to feed 12 other Americans. And for that stat, I just made a note so that I could easily come back to it. One to 12 being the ratio of farmer to the people they feed in 1919. Less than a century later, the picture is very different. Corn has muscled out most of the other plants and animals. The sheep, chickens, pigs, and horses are gone. So are most of the fruits and vegetables. George Naylor grows only two crops on his 470 acres, corn and soybeans. Corn has even pushed most of the people off the farm. Out of 300 million Americans, only 2 million are still farmers. That means the average American farmer today grows enough food to feed 140 other people. There's a couple interesting things happening for me in this paragraph. So this sentence that says that corn pushed people, most people, off the farm, this word, pushed, is really intentional, and it has certain connotations associated with it. It makes it sound like people didn't want to leave the farm, but somehow the corn is acting to move them off of the farm, which is an interesting concept. Um, it also make, it kind of makes corn seem aggressive or in control, which is something that um, I want to just keep in mind as I read. I also made an annotative note here saying that just at this point in about 2006, which is when this book was published, that the ratio from farmer to the people a farmer feeds is, a hun is 1 to 140. And that's an enormous increase from one, to t one farmer feeding 12 people in 1919. And I'm wondering what caused this such a large shift. Is it the shift from horses to tractors? Is it the fact that farms went from specializing or having lots of different items being grown on our farm to specializing to one kind of item? So all of those are questions I have about why that ratio would grow so, so quickly. The 140 people who depend on George Naylor for their food are all strangers. Like me, they live at the far end of a food chain that is long and complicated. George Naylor doesn't know the people he is feeding, and they don't know him. And I highlighted 
the food chain is long and complicated. And I actually went back and highlighted that after I read the next paragraph, because the next paragraph also kind of makes a reference to the fact that the food chain is really complex, and we don't really know where our food is coming from. It's almost like the path from the farm to the table is so complicated and obscured that we don't really know where our food comes from, which in my own life, I'm making an interesting connection because the farm to table movement is such a big deal in Sonoma County where I live. Um, and I think it might be this desire to return to a time when we actually knew where our food was from. I came to the Naylor farm as an unelected representative of the 140 people he feeds. I was curious to learn whom and what I'd find at the far end of the food chain that keeps me alive. Of course, I had no way of knowing if it was George or some other farmer who grows the corn that feeds the steer that becomes my steak. That's the nature of the industrial food chain. But I knew... So in the very first line, I highlighted, I came to the Naylor farm as an unelected representative of 140 people he feeds. And I just wrote the question, like, how can George Naylor feed 140 people when he grows two crops, right? Do all farms specialize in particular crops? What impact does that have on the quality of like topsoil? I thought you had to rotate crops. And obviously people can't subsist or live on uh, corn and soy alone. So that's an interesting statement to me. I also highlighted this statement about the fact that um, basically George, they're, they're feeding people that they don't to have any way of knowing. And then this statement about the fact that the corn feeds the steer. I know from my life beyond reading this text that cows aren't supposed to eat corn. Cows are supposed to eat grass. Uh, and so I'm wondering how that works. I knew that a Midwest cornfield, just like George Naylor's, is the place most of our food comes from. I plant corn. The day I showed up at the farm was supposed to be the only dry one all week, and George was trying to get his last 160 acres of corn planted. A week or two later, he'd start in on the soybeans. The soybean has become the second major crop in the industrial food chain. I'm noticing that this is the second time that he has referred to the industrial food chain. And I made a note that it reminds me of the industrial revolution, which makes me think of factories, um, this link, kind of this shift to unskilled labor, people who do like the same job over and over. So I guess they're skilled in that one job, um, but they don't do a variety of jobs. And maybe that's what's happening on the farm. And I think about the fact that they had a variety of you know, animals and food on the farm, and that no longer exists. So maybe there's kind of a, a similar shift happening. Taking turns each year in the field with corn. It now finds its way into two-thirds of all processed foods. I also made a note there, just like that statistic shocking. Corn is in two-thirds of all processed foods. Like, how is that even possible? For most of the afternoon... I sat on a rough cushion George had made for me from crumpled seed bags. After a while, he let me take the wheel. We drove back and forth across the field, a half a mile in each direction. Every pass across this field, which is almost perfectly flat, represents another acre of corn planted. I also highlighted that section because just the description of driving back and forth across this huge field half a mile in every direction it almost sounds like a really monotonous kind of job one that would get boring because you're doing the same thing over and over again which again is reminding me of the industrial revolution the same tasks being done over and over again the corn seed we were planting looked like regular kernels of corn but it was actually something called Pioneer Hybrid 34H31. You and I think of corn as corn, but farmers like Naylor know there are dozens of varieties, most created by large agribusiness companies. That's one of the reasons corn has succeeded so well. It's relatively easy for humans to breed new types of corn to fit our needs. 
And then I highlighted agribusiness here, which is a term that might cause a lot of people to stop. So it sounds like agriculture and business kind of smushed together to make this new word. So I'm thinking it's like the big business of farming. And then we have the word large right before it. So that also reinforces this idea of like big business of farming. And then this idea of companies making it seem like it's not just a single farm. It's a it's like a larger kind of organization. So I'm gonna allow the audio to play for the next paragraph, and I want you to think about doing a close read of that paragraph using some of these strategies, analyzing word choice, making predictions, asking questions, and making connections. But what's good for corn and agribusiness isn't always good for farmers. That's the case with the new types of corn seed. Back when George's grandfather started farming, farmers grew their own seed. That's the way farmers had always gotten their seed. They just kept some of their crop to be planted for the next season. Then, in the 1930s, seed companies came up with a new kind of corn seed. Hybrid corn. A hybrid is a plant or animal whose parents have different traits. For example, you might take a type of corn that resists disease and cross it with another type of corn that produces a lot of ears. The result is a hybrid, a disease-resistant plant that produces a lot of corn. Sounds good, right? 